first on the more outspoken. You know, I I kind of knew that I would become. I thought I might, and then when I started to become an issue in the presidential campaign, I couldn't see any way to make an utterance in that campaign that would clarify anything. It seemed to me that the discourse was so dishonest, and the kind of firestorm, the beast that is the kind of media, was so voracious that there was nothing I could do. And then. When my friend Jeremiah Wright tried to say something and got eaten alive, I, I saw it. No, you, you just don't say anything. So I just kept quiet and I went about my business. And I'm old enough and been around long enough to realize that, and this is, I think, a lesson for all of you, don't believe, you know, I guess it was Kurt Douglas was in England working with Sir John Gilgit as an actor. And he said to Gilgit, he was in his 40s, and he said to the great Shakespearean actor, I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm not devastated by the criticisms any longer. And Gilgit said to him, you're halfway there. Now get to the point where the praise doesn't seduce you. And then you'll be where you need to be. Don't be seduced by praise. Don't be devastated by criticism. Do what you think is right. Keep your own integrity. Know who loves you and who you love. And, and do, do your best. I mean, that's all you can do. And doubt that your best is good enough. But, I decided that I, I couldn't actually do anything except keep quiet and do my work. So every day, I got up and I was working on a comic book uh, with another with a young artist. And every day we got up and worked on a comic book. And every day I was bombarded with requests to talk. And every day I shut up. And my feeling was, and I still feel this way, that the narrative that was constructed first by Hillary Clinton and then by the McCain campaign was deeply dishonest. And what it did is created these characters of Jeremiah Wright, Rashid Khalidi, Father Flager, myself. And they were dishonest caricatures. And those caricatures have a life of their own. And so they still float around. And Glenn Beck still has me on his blackboard and all this stuff. And uh, you know that's just the way it is. It's out there, but it's not me. And I don't take it as me. But the other part of the narrative that's even more dangerous, and this is the part you should reject is the part that says, if Barack Obama, the mystery man, that's how they were you know, portraying him then. Now they've got him born in Kenya or somewhere. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, so he's not one of us. And, and then this mystery man, this, this difficult to understand person, has these shady friends. And if you can paint him as a mystery with shady friends, then the idea is that through guilt by association, he's guilty. And, and that is, the, the most degraded kind of politics in this country, and it has a long, uh, sickening history. So what we ought to do is reject it and say, let's assume Obama has talked to everybody in this room, the young Republicans, the, you know, the, young, the young philosophers, the young socialists, talk to all of them. And at the end of the day, he has a mind of his own. He decides what he thinks. Why is that a sin? In our culture, in our wild diversity, that should be a virtue, not a sin. And so there's no way to make that argument, and so I never did make it. I just thought until the thing was over. I just wanted it to pass by. It did pass by. And thankfully, people didn't buy that narrative particularly. But I do worry that the, the guilt by association clings on. And it clings on in a lot of ways. So I, I always get picketed by the Tea Party. Not tonight. I don't know why. Um, but. I guess one guy did, but um, but I, I was being picketed in Fresno, and I went outside to talk to them just to see if we could find some common ground, which was easy enough. Um, and the first two guys I came up to, I said, "What are you? Why are you picketing me?" And they said, "We don't know anything about you, but we heard you know Obama. We hate Obama." I said, "That's guilt by association. Don't blame me. You know, you hate him. Just hate him on his own right." You see what I'm saying? So it was guilt by association in reverse. Um, but one guy out there picketing was wearing a Ron Paul t-shirt. And so I said, I'll bet you and I agree about a lot of things. He said, like what? I said, I bet we agree on full queer rights. And he said, absolutely. And I said, even the right to marry. And he said, no, the state should not be involved in anyone's relationship. And I said, you convinced me. Now we agree. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, OK, we agree. And the woman standing next to him said, you think gay marriage is OK? I think it's an abomination. And I said, you guys talk among yourselves. I'm going over here. <laughs> I'm just saying. OK, thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Mark Friedman. Um, I'm an educator, a teacher, a social studies teacher in the Rochester City School District. And I'm also a community organizer with the uh, Community Education Task Force here locally. 
we were formed about a year and a half ago in opposition to mayoral control. Um, we went through you know, a lengthy struggle with that that seemed to have passed at the time. It's coming back up again. Uh, it's been reintroduced in the assembly by David Gann. And um, one thing that we knew that we would need to do in terms of organizing collaboratively, kind of building a collective struggle, was we needed to have kind of principles for change. So we built our principles for change, one of which is combating and struggling against institutional racism, right? And when we talk about cultural equity, you know, I get asked this question, and I oftentimes am like, okay, get out there and do something. Get into action, build with people. I sometimes get frustrated when people ask the question I'm about to ask you, which is, you know, what are the best kind of pressure point places, and what are some kind of specific strategies in terms of struggling on a kind of local and then a state level for something like cultural equity when we have an institution like education, which is so thoroughly racist? Well, there's two things. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know what the pressure points are, and I don't know the correct way to move forward, but I do know. I, in fact, I think we all should recognize that looking backward, we're all geniuses, but looking forward, we're kind of uncertain what's next. So um, you all, you know, it's like, it's like what happened in Tahrir Square in Egypt. Be, the month before it happened, you couldn't have picked Hosni Mubarak out of a police lineup. Nobody knew, I mean, you guys didn't know Egypt from the hole in your head, but now, you know, and, and that revolution was impossible in December. Today, that revolution is inevitable. So I say all that simply to say, it's hard looking forward to know what to do, but that doesn't mean we're paralyzed. There are things we should do, and among the things we should do is speak up actively, look for allies, search, I think the idea of having, you know, institute, you know principles for change makes sense. We need to, among the things we need to do in the educational debate is shift the frame of what we're talking about. So, and this is what I mean, you'll, you'll see this very easily. During the last presidential campaign, every time a candidate got, and even accelerating since then, every time a politician gets to the microphone and says, we need to get the lazy, incompetent teachers out of the classroom, don't you feel yourself nodding dully? I do, okay, what am I gonna say? My granddaughter deserves the lazy, incompetent teacher. Keep her right there. No, I mean, I get it, you know, of course. But the thing is, he wins the argument by the way he frames it. He wins it by saying, we need to get the lazy, incompetent teacher out of the classroom. If I got to the microphone first and said, every public school kid deserves an intellectually grounded, morally committed, compassionate, caring, well-rested, and well-paid teacher in the classroom, I'd win that argument. So the pro problem is, in part, a problem of framing. The noisy voices, the loud voices, the powerful voices have got the microphone, and they're beating the hell out of teachers, out of unions, out of parents. So thank you very much for sending us your superintendent. You know, he's being advertised. We were very much opposed to him and helped put him out, so <laughs> you're welcome. But you know, in the Chicago Tribune, he's described as a guy who knows how to fight unions and he knows how to fight parents, just what we don't need, right? <laughs> anyway, so I don't, all I'm saying is part of the problem is reframing. Part of the problem is not allowing yourself to sink into cynicism where you feel like, and this is a, a, across the board, but it's true for educators. We sometimes feel as progressive people that we are a minority and we have to s defend ourselves, you know, kind of from our barricaded position. That's wrong. Or we think, and this is, I, I fear this for a lot of intellectuals, we think we're so smart and clever that nobody else could understand what we're talking about. I don't agree at all. I think we have to talk to one another, we have to talk to strangers, we have to reach out and build a kind of collective understanding of where we are and move forward. Mostly, I think, on the 10 important issues that are most important to me, like teaching and education, like um, gay rights, like um, anti-racism, like war and occupation. I feel like I'm in the majority in this country. I don't feel for a minute that I'm in the minority. I may not have the power to affect those things, but I feel like most people agree, and so I don't have to be kind of hunkered down, hiding behind something, I'm fine. And I think if I can just articulate it properly, frame it properly, people will agree. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I recently just finished Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton, and uh, I was wondering, in it you briefly mentioned SDS and New Left, I believe, so I was wondering, what your opinions on him and his philosophies are, and if anything, what should 
be reiterated? I never read the book, and I, I knew Huey from a distance, but you know he's passed away many years ago. Um, I, I was very close to the Black Panther Party, but I was much closer to it in Chicago than o Oakland. And Huey, you know, like a lot of, you know, really amazing, he was an amazing young man, a very courageous young man. And later in life, he, um, I don't know, he got drawn into a world of drugs and crime, and, and I thought that was a shame. But I don't know the book, and I don't really know. But I'll tell you, you know, it, I think it's worth looking, if you're interested in history, as Mika was talking about, uh, there are a couple things I'd recommend to you. One is, I think you should read the speeches of Martin Luther King from 1965 to 1968. It will blow your mind. I mean, you, you know, we have an image of King, the prayer breakfast and all that, that has this kind of gentle, you know, uh, you know, guy who, who, did, who, who was always kind of the same. He didn't change. Actually, he was only an activist for 12 years, and he evolved every year. And if you read one thing from King, read his speech at Riverside Church on April 4th, 1967, one year to the day before his death, where he calls he, the United States the greatest purveyor of violence on earth. And he says, we need to have a revolution of values in this country in order to join the world revolution on the right side. That's King. And he's making the connection between what he calls racial justice, global justice, and economic justice. That was a heavy, heavy thing that he did. And he says it in that speech very clearly. He said it in a lot of other places. So read King. And then the other thing to read, of course, is the history of the Black Panther Party and Black Power. King's last book was called, um, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And in that, he discusses Black Power at great length. And he does not actually condemn it out of hand, which people think he did, but he did not. So I think you should read King. I think you should read James Foreman. Read um, Stoker Chronicle. Yeah, they're all worth reading. But I think the most important thing is to read that stuff so that you can get a focus on racism as it finds itself iterated today, and then find ways to struggle against it now. Right, thanks. thanks very much. Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Mitch. Um, I had a question for you as a parent. Um, I have a daughter that's going, that um, is in her first year in the Rochester City School District. First grade? Uh, no, kindergarten. Uh, kindergarten. kindergarten. And um, she's, um, they're already teaching social studies, and she's learning things like that Christopher Columbus discovered America, <laughs> that Thomas Jefferson was a great guy that thought that all men were created equal. Um, you know, uh, so how do you kind of counter that as a parent, um, sort of uh, break up that hegemony that, um, that's taught in the, in the school system. Well, you know, the wonderful thing, I'm, I'm tickled that you asked me that as a parent and a grandparent. I have a daughter in the, a granddaughter in the first grade in the Chicago public schools, um, and then one in preschool in the Chicago public schools, um, and not in magnet schools, just in the neighborhood school. So they, my kids and I face the same thing, and of course I raised three kids, and I think you know this, but I mean, as a parent, your first and fundamental responsibility is to give this kid a sense of unconditional love and being safe and cared for by you. And that's more important than all the kind of, um, you know, other stuff that's going on. I think that's where we all start. And then I would go to the gentleman, the teacher from Rochester, I'd go to what he just said. Parents have to not only kind of provide in your own home alternatives, and the wonderful thing uh, about books, for example, is you can find Rethinking Columbus. You can find um, books where girls are doing amazing things. You can find books where gay people are doing astonishing things. Black people are, are, are solving problems. And so it's not like you're, you're, the only education is those six hours she's going to be in kindergarten in the Rochester schools. There's a lot else going on. But the other thing I would recommend is that you link up with other parents and teachers and try to create the conditions for a sensible alternative to the kind of propaganda that often passes for education. One quick example, my daughter-in-law, in meeting with you know, the teacher for a parent conference, they had a long conversation about, um, about, uh, about my granddaughter, and they came to a lot of agreement. And then the teacher said, well, now I'm going to give you a report card. And my daughter-in-law said, you know, I just, I've thought about this a long time, and with all respect, I don't want you to give me the report card. I won't read it. I'll throw it away. I don't think first graders should get report cards. 
and I love you, and I love what you're doing with my daughter, but I don't want to read the report card ever. And the teacher looked taken aback for a minute, and then she leapt over the desk and hugged my daughter-in-law. And she said, you're the first parent in 10 years who's ever said that, and you're right. Well, that means that if she could reach out to five other parents, they'd have, a, they'd have an activist core uh, to get rid of the report card. You could do that, too, and I recommend that you do. <clears throat> How many folks, there's too many folks at the, at the mic, aren't there? Yeah. You're the end, it's too many. Let's just do two more and then the rest of y'all can come up and talk to me. Is that all right? Or, uh, you, know, you know what I'm here okay, for. Four more. <laughs> all right, six more. All right, seven more. Why don't you guys decide? What time is it? I don't even know what time it's it is. It's 10.35. It seems like we've gone a long time, but it, okay, nobody else get in line, please. And anybody who wants to drop out, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Good be, evening. I'll be brief, okay. Um, I was interested about what you said about uh, doubt and dogma, and I was wondering, uh, frankly, how that relates to your experience in the Weather Underground. Oh. Because you say that uh, doubt guards against dogma, but you need a certain ideological consistency to feel comfortable yeah. acting. No, you know, yeah, I, I didn't really talk about the Weather Underground, but one of the great, you know, my, as I've said to many people many times, you can't be whatever you are, 20 years old, and not have a lot of regrets in your life. You can't be 66 and not have a lot of regrets. So I have a lot of regrets, and one of the regrets I have in the political work that I've been involved in is the extent to which we sunk into dogma. The great criticism I have of the Weather Underground is that they had no doubt, you know, and that was their problem. Uh, my criticism of them isn't that they took extreme action against a war that was killing 6,000 people a week. That's not my problem with them. My problem with them, us, is that we actually turned friends into enemies and we thought we knew everything. And we lived, as I said in my book, Fugitive Days, in the well-lit prison of a single good idea. I don't recommend it. I don't think you should live in a well-lit prison of a single good idea. I think you should be open to a lot of ideas. And dogma is death to thought. So yes, the weather underground was dogmatic. Right. But um, how do you walk the line to be an activist with a certain amount of ideological consistency? I'm not right. talking well, about revolutionary. I, I, yeah. That, that's, that's exactly the dilemma. And the dilemma is how do you open your eyes, act, and then doubt. And then open your eyes and act and doubt. It is a dialectical problem, but it's not a problem that can be solved formulaically uh, in, on a piece of paper. So now I know I'm doing it perfectly. It's a matter of you and the people you work with being willing to act, knowing that you're, that you're acting on contingent and partial knowledge contingent and partial knowledge, and have the humility to know that that's what you're doing. And then if you doubt, and that means rethink, recalibrate, rewonder, explore, and then act again. If you stop acting, you're giving in to inertia. If you stop doubting, you're becoming dogmatic. Yep. If anybody wants to drop out of that line, I'm open to it. All right. How are you doing? Um, my question relates to what you said about the public and private high schools and middle schools and elementary schools and how that relates to colleges and public and private universities. You said that you're, my assumption is that you're from a private university, you taught at Indiana University, which is a private university. No, 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 I taught at the University of Illinois. University of Illinois, okay, yeah. so it's a private okay. university, correct? It's a public university. Oh, but, it's public. But I would call the University of Michigan, the University of California, and the University of Illinois private universities with a public name. In other words, when they were founded, they were supported by public taxes. Now, the University of Michigan had, gets 90% of its money from private sources, and including tuition, and it only gets about 10 or 15% from the state, and that's wrong. I think it should be a public university, open to the public, open to the kids of Michigan. Okay, so that's basically sums up my question. So you think that the way that, the, you know, like, not just the way uh, public private schools are being held at a lower level, but also at a collegiate university that they, all students, as you said, and people are uncollectible beings, or uncalculable beings. So we should yeah. all have the same opportunity to go to similar universities. There shouldn't be like a barrier between, say, U of R versus Brockport. You know, like kids at U of R look at more prestigious than kids at Brockport, whereas it should be equal. And once we graduate, their degree, which is a piece of paper, gives them more opportunity to a lot of 
jobs as we read it in the newspaper, but to me, I don't think that's right, and I want to know what you think about that. Well, what I think is that there ought to be generously funded, generously supported public schools from preschool through university. I think kids should have a right to go to school, whether they're born rich or not. I think you have a right to go to school and get out of school without being kind of shackled with a debt that's going to last for 20 years. That's not fair, and it's not reasonable, and it's not healthy in a democracy. So no, I think you should go to a school that's excellent. And by excellent, I don't necessarily mean equal. Schools are different, you know, but I think that we should all aspire to, and, and two quick things. We should aspire to have every school, you know, we should aspire to have every kid have access to an excellent, excellent higher education. And then we should rethink work. It shouldn't be that going to college is just simply job training. You should be, uh, you know, thinking of the development of your full human personality. Everything about you can be challenged and developed in college. That's what it's for. And then, here's the interesting thing. It's true that if you have a Harvard degree, it's, you know, somehow, you know, smells better than, you know, a SUNY degree, I suppose. But the interesting thing is that once you get two steps away from college, you're gonna be judged on what you do. And it's, a, you know, it's gonna turn out that, yeah, it's like this. Uh, what year are you here? Okay. You know, you work your ass off to get a certain grade on the SAT. Nobody has ever asked you again what you got. Nobody gives a shit. I don't care. Uh, what, by the way, what did you get? No, I'm just kidding. I don't give a shit. And the reason nobody gives a shit is because it's a gate. Nobody actually cares. It doesn't measure anything. It's a gate to get you to the next level. That's part of why it's so stupid to be so obsessed about the SATs and all that. But that's the same with a college degree. You're going to come out of here. Your responsibility is to educate yourself. And, and don't ever think it's any other way. You should educate yourself. Take responsibility for asking questions, getting the best you can, and then go forth and do good. It's like, it's like you know, you get hired at a university and you think, like I got hired as a professor. And people think, well, where you went to school really matters. It turns out it doesn't matter at all. Once you're one year in the job, it matters what you're doing now. That's what matters. So, Love your degree, but get your education. And remember that the, the, no education be, can be given to you as if you're a passive vessel. An education must be seized. You must take an education and use this opportunity to do everything you can to become the most educated person you can. Thank you. Hey, what's up, Bill? Yo, How's it going? What's up? Quick question. So along the lines of quality versus quantity in education like you talked about, um, it's obvious that our country has been kind of on this democratic uh, no experiment, whatever you want to call it, for since 1776. And uh, a lot of our decisions as politicians and the rest of our country are based on economic interests. How do we get students, how do we get children to morally invest themselves into our I was senior, and I'm going to be student teaching next year, I know. and I'll be in the workforce. So I'm going to be teaching these kids, so give me some good advice. Okay, well, I, I got a lot of advice, but it's going to take me longer than we have tonight. But, but let me just say this. In the history of this country, you talk about it as a wild experiment. I think that's a good characterization. In the history of this country, there's been a battle going on from the beginning between the individual and individual rights and the community, and the community's good. And that struggle, that contestation, is alive and well. Now it is true that since 1980, those who favor privatization and the individual over the commons and the public have, been, have gained a lot of traction. But that doesn't mean that the fight is over. There's still a fight between what is good on the commons, what is good in the public square, and what is good for the individual. And we have to keep that fight alive. And I don't know always how to do it, but I think that that's the struggle we're involved in. You, you guys know, you've heard of the, the concept of the tragedy of the commons. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So the idea that, you know, that we would, I, I have a, we go to a place on a river in California where the salmon have stopped running. They ran there for centuries, for thousands of years, and now they've stopped. Why? Because commercially we fished them out. It used to be that you'd say, we need this many salmon, that's how many we'll catch. But then somebody realized, geez, if I catch a surplus, I can sell them down at the, at the border and build a brick house. That leads to, over time, to killing all the salmon. And 
That's the, that's the metaphor for what we're doing to the planet. We're killing it because in our rush to corner something for me, we forget about us. So in the struggle between me and us, let's remember that that goes back to the very beginning. And in the last 30 years, there's been an accelerating sense that everything public is bad. Every part of the commons is bad, but that has to be beaten back. The commons is a good thing. We need a healthy, large, expanding public. We don't need to give up on it. Yes, go ahead. Good evening. Yes, sir. Good to see you again. Thank you. Nice you remember to see you. Detroit? Yes, of course. Yes, sir. Uh, you gave, I know he was asking, you gave a young man a reading list. I wanted to tell him to put the mouth on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we, and not only, not, only, All of them. not only the autobiography, but Manning Marable's new book uh, on Malcolm X is a marvelous book. Yeah. Yes, yes, the late, the late uh, Manning Marble. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to see if I can string several things together that I heard and then just ask you to elaborate. If you will. By the way, I'm part of the same organization as Mark, part of the Parent Community Education Task Force. Uh, actually, the Community Education Task Force. I threw the parent in there. Uh, but and would you tell Karen and others in Chicago, because we're sort of in touch with them, that we're very serious about building a national movement. Tell them we believe since Rosard is coming, she needs to go ahead and buy those boxing gloves that she needs. She's going to need them. She'll need them. And you'll fit right in with Rhyme in this crowd. But get ready for a fight. No doubt about it. Thank you. Um, now, the young man who asked about, he said he's a parent. And he asked about, you know, his child, his Bible, I think he said. He had taught about Christopher Columbus and I'm sure many other things that are inaccurate, just plain inaccurate scholarship in the curriculum. I thought you gave him good advice in terms of creating alternatives and what he should be doing at home and so forth. But also, would you agree, I'm just going to string these few things together then if you would elaborate. Would you agree, I think, that it's important for us to challenge the curriculum we got to challenge it at the state level, where it comes from. To do that, effectively, we must organize. As parents, as community members, we must organize. We're actually going to have to challenge the institution that produces it. And, the, and demand, as parents and community, accurate scholarship. We don't want our babies miseducated. And if they don't know how to create it, then we can help them create it. Uh, that and, um, you know, and it, it speaks to institutionalized racism. Also, tell, talk to me a little bit more about this, if you will, because these, I think these are all connected. You said it's important for us as individuals not to put too much emphasis on one thing. You know, I'm black or I'm gay or I'm whatever I am. But then as a black man living in thoroughly racist America, I got to tell you, my emphasis is on my blackness. And that don't mean I walk around saying that I'm black, I'm black, I my chest. But I can never forget it, not for a second. And I must, I must teach my sons that. I have to. Even when I don't want to, I got to. And I got to teach them early so that hopefully they understand it clearly. 